we're going to discuss this book. And I have my uh, dad and my brother. So my dad is uh, Scott Harris, and he's a pastor, uh, graduated from Master Seminary. And um, my brother is a school teacher in Tennessee. One of the things that I wanted to bring you into is the discussions um, growing up my family would have around the kitchen table usually. But we would talk about things that we were reading. Some, sometimes things I would read in school. Um, books like this, I, like Ideas of Consequences, are really, I think, good for that because there's just a lot of material in it that's really thought-provoking. In fact, we could probably spend days and days talking about some of the things Richard Weaver brings up. And the reason I want to do this is because it's a lot different than what I've been doing on the podcast, which is talking about evangelical elites and where they're messing up sometimes, and social justice in particular, that issue. And it can be really discouraging, I think, for a lot of people who everywhere they turn, it's bad. There, there's problems there. And we're going to talk about some bad things again today. But I wanted to at least put positive resources in your hands. Um, instead of doing a lot of book reviews on here's another bad book and let's talk about how bad this book is, I wanted to start giving you authors and books that are helpful in uh, certain ways. And this is a book that I found helpful. And people have often asked me how I started the podcast, where I got my understanding of the issues that I'm critiquing. And it, it's hard for me to answer that because there's a whole bunch of authors and influences, but Richard Weaver is definitely one of them. Weaver is considered a conservative, and I want to read for you a, um, a quote from him from a, a, a work that he did called Life Without Prejudice. He says this, It is my contention that a conservative is a realist. He believes that there is a structure of reality independent of his own desire. He believes that there is a creation which was before him, which exists now, not just by his sufferance, and which will be here after he's gone. This structure consists not merely of the great physical world, but also of many laws, principles, and regulations which control human behavior. Though this reality is independent of the individual, it is not hostile to him. It is, in fact, amenable by him in many ways, but it cannot be changed radically or arbitrarily. This is the cardinal point. The conservative holds that man in this world cannot make his will his law without any regard to limits and to fix the fixed nature of things. So you see in Weaver's conception of what conservatism is, something that I think a lot of modern conservatives, conservative industry, conservative thinkers, they've lost this, that it's the permanent things. Uh, it's, it's this idea that there is a created order and that we ought to conform ourselves to that. We, it's not just that we have practical ideas that are better than the left, better than those who hate God even. It's that we actually are trying to live within the natural world, the pattern that God has laid down. And so um, Richard Weaver, just a little biography about him. He was the oldest of four siblings. His father died when he was six. His father owned a livery stable near Asheville, North Carolina. And after the death of his father, his family moved to Lexington, Kentucky. So he was a Southerner. And that's where his mother managed a uh, millinery business, which is uh, hats. They made hats. Weaver became a socialist in college at the University of Kentucky, but, but rejected socialism while attending Vanderbilt University, where he fell in love with the Old South under the tutelage of John Crow Ransom. And there's a book, actually, John Crow Ransom contributes to called I'll Take My Stand. And we may do one of those, uh, that book or one of those essays uh, in the future for uh, this uh, format. But anyway, that's who he studied under. And his dissertation was published in a book called The Southern Tradition at Bay. And in that book, he praised the besieged virtues of hierarchy, chivalry, and religiousness that he found in the Old South. Weaver received his PhD from Louisiana State University, and he taught rhetoric for most of his career at the University of Chicago. He intended to retire and live in his ancestral land in Weaverville, North Carolina, but a heart attack in 1963 prevented his plans from becoming reality. Weaver is recognized today as one of the main founders of the traditionalist element of modern conservatism, which focused on preserving Western traditions against modern societies, technology, industrialism, and urbanization. His prophetic insights ensure his continued relevance through his 20-year career. Weaver published 115 book reviews, essays, and pamphlets. Eight books are published under his name. Ideas Have Consequences in 1948 is his most famous.
David, why don't you talk about when you first encountered the book and what you thought of it? I think I recommended it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it was probably about five or six years ago. And it was, um, uh, I think it was uh, before we had gone to that Abbeville conference, but, um, or right before or right after, maybe it was right after. Uh, so it was probably like five years ago, but uh, I read it. And then a mutual friend of ours who passed away a few years ago, um, he read it as well. And we both were um, really concerned about Weaver's uh, opinion on jazz because we both enjoyed jazz a lot. Uh, but <laughs> there was um, there was a few there was a few lines in particular that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. So um, I mean, Weaver is good at weaving um, <laughs> different <laughs> sorry uh, different strains of um, like sort of big picture and smaller picture. Uh, you know, aspects of reality and like just the world that we live in and the society that we inhabit. Um, but the what he really hit me with was, uh, and when I was reading through this again, it again hit me like a ton of bricks, uh, was my own, um, my own position sort of in society, in, in the economy, how I function as an individual. And, um, that really comes across. I know we'll get into specifics, but one, one particular area that I, I, to me, it's probably my um, favorite quote in the whole book, but uh, in the third chapter, when he talks about um, the, like the development of the modern, uh, the modern kind of ideal man. And he juxtaposes that to uh, historic, and he talks about kind of what was ideal, what was the ideal, like man, and um, what has changed is specialization. And so it was ironic because when I first read the book, I had been listening to a conservative talk show host, and I was also teaching economics at a high school, and so I was being really, really heavily influenced by like libertarian uh, philosophy and thought. Because most of the resources, the best resources I could find on economics came from libertarians. And when I read Ideas Have Consequences, I realized, like, this is kind of, like, empty. And um, it's my what, – what I think of as an ideal man because of specialization, like, in my own typical – like, my own specific career uh, field, um, I think the word he uses is – um, I had it right here in front of me. Well, he uses the word anxiety a lot, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of, oh, emasculation. That's the word that he uses. He says it's emasculating, basically, to be a yeah. hyper-specialized, um, to be in, you know, in, in your career or your place in society to be hyper-specialized. And I realized, like, oh, this is kind of where I am career-wise. So I've been kind of pigeonholed into this extremely specific role that I'm supposed to be the expert on. But then when I look around, I'm like, uh, uh, I, th th this isn't fulfilling, you know? Right, so right. as a teacher, I really enjoyed when I was, um, when I was able to, you know, teach and interact with a lot of different subjects. I taught government, history, economics, geography. And then after I went through grad school, I kind of focused on this one particular area. And um, so Weaver kind of helped me see that um, there's more to it than just your little place that you fit into the puzzle in society. And it made me kind of start to strive to want to be a more complete man. Yeah. I, I, I finally figured out how to show the presentation <laughs> to everyone out there while you can see us. So sorry about that. There's going to be some kinks I'm going to have to work out, but, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, David. And since I asked you, I might as well ask you dad. Um, so I know that I was the one who introduced you to this. I think a few you months were. ago, um, but you've read it a few times. So what were your initial impressions? Um, and why did you think you had to read it again? Because it was thick or just? Uh, no. It's actually, um, actually, I'm going to read the very first quote that starts in the book. Uh, the past shows unbearingly that when a people's freedom disappear, it goes not with a bang, but in silence amid the comfort of being cared for. That is the dire peril of the present trend towards uh, statism. If freedom is not found accompanied by willingness to resist and to reject favors rather than to give up what is intangible but precarious, 
will not long be found at all. That was written in 1962. So right from the beginning, I read this, I'm like, as I'm reading through the first reading, I had to keep going back and, when did he write this? 1948, how is that, how is that possible? I was amazed at the insights this man had of where society was going, and it explains a lot about where we are. That was the first reading, is just more of a, uh, maybe kind of just a shock of a guy that long ago, you know, foreseeing where it's going. Um, the second reading has been more <clears throat> uh, thoughtful of trying to understand him, and as I did, it became very clear his tie into the Southern Agrarians, and uh, you know, I, it would be good to take uh, a look at, I'll take my stand, and where those thoughts came out. Interesting change from him from being an avid socialist into the man he became. Um, he taught rhetoric, but <laughs> he seems to be more of a philosopher, and he ties a whole lot of things uh, philosophically and trends going and where we were going, because as he looked at the past, he could see the trends. Um, so it's been a very good book to read. Uh, it also came out in my second reading as I'm looking at more closely where uh, some of the weaknesses are is because he uh, <clears throat> tied into Southern traditions, which I think he put it as a religiousness or something like that. Older religiousness, yeah. Um, but he himself has a little familiarity with the scriptures, but really not much. So he keeps trying to tie things back to something that's um, more foundational than kind of where we are now as a society that everything's completely transitioning all the time. And so there is nothing stable, but he doesn't tie it that well into what really a foundation, though he gives um, some reference to it. And actually it's God right. and the world that he's created. But from a philosophical point, that is his foundation and why traditions became so important to him. And I think even, uh, among the the southern traditionalists now why it's so important that's stability so yeah. it's been a very good reading i really appreciate you uh in, introducing to me uh, to him here's a summary of the book for everyone um man's metaphysical dream of the world is fractured because pragmatic concerns in the immediate replace faith in timeless ideals as a result a subjective sentimentality characterizes culture the only remedy for this is found within the restraints of a harmonized vision Chapter one, uh, he talks about this vision. He says it's unreachable as long as social hierarchy is rejected in favor of egalitarianism. Um, chapter two, the specialist is revered above the philosopher. That's, that's another barrier to re reaching this vision. Uh, chapter three, um, egotism. Uh, if it motivates the craftsman, then that's another barrier. He says in chapter four, in the absence of a harmonized vision, something he calls the great stereoptagon, which we'll define later, induces societal function. Uh, chapter five, he says salvation becomes the effortless harnessing of nature for temporary physical gratification. And then in the last chapters, which we probably won't get to today, um, he says the restoration of a harmonized vision can come through a respect for private property and an exposure to the forms through an education in the linguistics and piety and justice. So that's Richard Weaver's book in a nutshell. And um, his purpose, he said, was to account for the loss of standards and values. And, and we see that in our own society. He saw it in his. It's more so now. And the challenge forces that threaten the found, and he wanted to challenge that, and the forces that he believed threaten the foundations of civilization. So the, the picture he paints is kind of bleak. His thesis is that the defeat of logical realism in the great medieval debate was the crucial event in the history of Western culture. From this flowed those acts which issue now in modern decadence. And so he talks about nominalism, William of Ockham um, in the medieval era, proposing this, um, uh, what they call it nominalism now, but this, this idea that things aren't really, that, that the categories that unite things uh, don't really exist, that our sensory perception is really all there is. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but he thinks that that led to a rejection of ideals, of absolutes, of what he calls the transcendentals. And when rejecting these, we've lost so much. Now, if we ever lived to see what we see today with the loss of even gender, um, he, he would just be, he would say, yeah, that's exactly, he would trace it right back there and say, we lost it when 
we rejected um, really it's Platonism. It's it's a kind of Platonism. The slackening hand of Plato has led to the the gender issue and all the things that we're seeing where we don't have definitions and language doesn't mean anything anymore um, because we don't believe in a world in which there's order in which there's reality. So Weaver supports a recovery of intellectual integrity, which enables men to perceive the order of goods. So he wants to find a solution to this. So with that, we'll start um, the discussion, and I'll just give you a quick run through chapter one, and then we'll start talking about chapter one. In the first chapter, Weaver, um, it, the title is The Unsentimental Sentiment. Weaver argues that people necessarily experience feelings of oughtness from a source of clarification before engaging their rational faculties. So that, in other words, uh, people people know that there's something there's so, that, that something they're supposed to do something that's good or bad if you think in moral terms but there's uh, there's a purpose there's a telos and th this is how they start out this is how we all start out apart from any sensory perception we know that there's purpose there's design in front of us rejecting the existence of these transcendentals means there is no definition of man which erodes notions of sentiment and hierarchy uh, the result is the creation of a world where inhibiting expression is wrong and the heroic ideals disappear. This can only bring about the destruction of society as people fail to recognize obscenity and pursue immediate gratification. Weaver argues that before imposing ideas that can limit this destruction, they must be harmonized by some vision. And so that's his first chapter. And really what he's saying, if I could just sum it up for my, in my own words, is that if you lose standards, if you lose the design and the willingness, the desire to conform yourself to that, that ought that we all know is out there, then what ends up happening is you crumble into societal chaos. You get what we had in 2020. You get riots um, because there is no transcendental anymore. There is, there is nothing to bind you to any course of action. Uh, there, there's no definition for what man is. Man's just an animal at that point. So... You know, this means that we can level all the hierarchies. Um, we can, uh, we can really, we can do what we want because the world is putty in our hands. So the question, uh, the first question that I thought was, um, he says something interesting in chapter one. He says the this failure, and he's talking about obscenity, the failure of, of having increased obscenity is not connected with the decay of Puritanism. On, on page twenty six, he says this. And I was thinking about how a lot of Christians uh, try to combat obscenity and crassness and just the, the sexual stuff that's out there now. And some do this kind of neo-Puritan thing, I guess, where um, I, 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 you could use a different word. You don't have to use. I mean, it's, I'm using the word he uses, but they want to imply they want to put more rules in effect, essentially. And, you know, keep my kids from being bad. Right. And he says, that's not the root of this. That's not the problem. It's not like we had a failure in rules. It's not <laughs> rules went away and no, there's something else bigger uh, that's going on here. And that's what the chapter's about. And if we don't recognize, I think, the underlying cause of why there's so much obscenity, why on television or on the internet or otherwise, then we won't know how to even do things like raise kids properly. Because just putting in more barriers and rules is not getting to the heart of it. Um, so I'm going to just open it up. Uh, for you guys, since I've been talking a while, uh, David uh, or Dad, um, I mean, wh wh what do you think of that? I mean, do you? Wh what would you? I mean, obviously, Dad, you raised us, so um, do you think what <coughs> Weaver's talking about in Chapter One is something that you realized in raising children and teaching people how to raise children that there's they have to have a, a larger vision than just rules? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you definitely have to have rules. Uh, children need boundaries because uh, they're not equipped to go outside those boundaries and deal with uh, the rest of the world. <clears throat> but your goal as a parent is to raise those children so that there's something in the heart that understands what the world's about, where it's going. Um, he's using the term, I guess, transcendental, but it's that God has a purpose for you being here and your ultimate purpose is to please him. Um, so that you can hear, well done now, good and faithful servant, uh, when you pass from this life or Christ comes first. Um, so yeah, that's what your mother and I, you know, worked real hard at is giving you the moral reasons why we would do something or not do something so that your um, own convictions as you got older would then 
lead you into whatever situation you you know got into to make a, a proper decision based on something more than what was expedient at the moment. Uh, boundaries are not going to work um, when you're away from other people. Um, <laughs> what you're you're doing by yourself, what boundary you're going to put there? There's always a way around it. Boundaries help. They you know keep you on uh, on the path. You know where the edges are. Uh, if, it, if you're driving a car, we were teaching you to do that. We tried to teach you how to steer and be safe. And the boundaries were the edge of the road. And when you went off the edge, you got in trouble because you were all rumbling around and I would holler at you uh, to get back on it. But we wanted to train you with the skills to stay on the road and why it's important. That way, no matter where you were, whether there was a, a fence up or not, you knew how to you know, go on the right path. Uh, map reading the same thing all those things that all end up with a moral aspect to it did you know what you're doing why you're doing it where you were going um so it was training the heart more than anything else yeah <clears throat> and that's all christians should have that it's it's a curious thing to me that so many i don't think do though so many do think that um there a rule is this sort of imposed external thing that you limit someone's choices by which it is but that's like that's all it is and it's because god says so and i think what weaver's tapping into here is that there's an order though there's a there's a goodness to the order that uh, exists in creation so it's it's um even though we have the curse of sin there's a way that god initially in eden did intend for us to live and we're all kind of pre-wired exactly. to know that that exists <laughs> that there is this thing out there um, and it's not in, we can't find it inside of us. And, and his, what he keeps critiquing in this nominalism for, for those who, um, maybe this will make sense is this notion that you can find the deep truths in yourself, that it's not out there. It's actually in here. And that's what he blames for all the problems that we're having pretty much is it's, it's through experience that we, he um, says Go ahead. in the, in, in the, this is before chapter one, but in the introduction that this is one of the, I think one of the best quotes in the entire book, but, um, when he says man is constantly being assured today that he has more power than ever before in history, but his daily experience is one of powerlessness, yeah, you know? So quote. you, you kind of have this, uh, that one really, <laughs> because, um, you kind of, I mean, we've been millennials as millennials, I guess we've been raised with this. I do this cultural idea that, um, you know, the answers are within yourself. And then you, you know, you get into your twenties and thirties, you start to have kids, you realize you actually know nothing. And, um, and that's, that's when the powerlessness really sets in. And so what do you see? You see like a mass collapse. Um, he kind of gets into that when he talks about like, um, at a little later, but when he talks about kind of mass anxiety, um, of think of, of feeling like you have the, the answers are found within you. But in chapter one, when he's talking about obscenity, he says um, that if you take the the idea that history is moving in the same, uh, like in the direction of progress, like it's just in this endless march towards progress. And then if you combine that with the, um, the failure of obscenity, that there really isn't anything obscene, then you get, I, th I think it's, yeah, I have it here. Um, then you get a virtue of desecration. And it's just strange that he wrote that in the 40s because the late 40s, because when you think of his time period, you you tend to think of the idyllic, of that being the idyllic time in history. That's the most wholesome time. That's the time that, you know, we wish we could go back to. And I would still, in many ways, I would still hold to that because um, there would well, be a lot compared of positive to the present. <laughs> compared to the present. But it's still, he's, he's seeing this kind of start to play out. And now we live in that reality. And, you know, that, that's the nature. I mean, I'm a teacher. I work in, in, in school. So I'm kind of, I'm very familiar with the mass social um, implications of, you know, desecration. So the question, I have a little one now. The question I have is like, okay, so how am I, how exactly am I supposed to raise this child in the midst of, of a culture that um, holds desec the desecration of, you know, yeah, I, I think what you're saying is um, he, that it's a worse moral evil to limit someone, to put up a barrier and say, you can't express yourself, your authentic self inside of you, than 
uh, that's what people, or, or I don't know how to, how to really phrase it, but that, that, um, uh, that the experience they have that makes them think that they need to do something sexual or to do something, whatever, violent, it's, it's a worse moral evil to put the barrier up and say, you can't do that than to do it. <laughs> like, whereas I think at Weaver's time, it, it's funny because we, what you just said, that society would have wanted, that was the Hayes code. I mean, they were trying to limit what Holly was, was putting out. Um, it, it reads well, like to, I, I don't know they're trying to live. They're trying to direct it toward. It would not be something obscene, uh, <clears throat> destroying the values of the culture. So it was trying to put some guidelines in there because they had lost their way. He actually has a really good quote, I think, on what you're talking about here, page 24, mm -hmm. uh, top of the page. Today, over the entire world, there are dangerous signs that culture, as such, is marked for attack because of its formal requirements stand in the way of expression of the natural man. So what he's really getting at there, though he's not saying that way because he's not theological he's philosophical it's this is the, the the sin nature of man and uh the Hayes code and things like that we're trying to well defining obscenity you can't put out pornography all those things we're trying to keep this expression of natural man's sinful bent to whatever he wants and thinks it's better uh for him with some adult guidances that no it's not this right. stuff is dangerous to you this is this is destroy you and frankly the under the Hayes codes the movies were a lot better if you look at the the way they could create ideas without having to be obscene and showing what doesn't need to be seen right me John Doe it's a wonderful life the Oxbow incident oh. the searchers oh. you know, Mr Smith goes to Washington yeah Frank Frank Sergeant Capra York. stuff it, he. He says this on uh, page 26, right after the quote you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> making a virtue of desecration. He says, in the 19th century, this change came visibly over the world, bringing expressions of concern from people who had been brought up in the tradition of proper sentiment. Propriety, like other old-fashioned anchorages, was abandoned because it inhibited something. So, and he says, proud of its shamelessness, the new journalism served up in swaggering style ma matter, which um, Hero for had been veiled in decent, and I can't even say that word, <laughs> taciturnary, ternity, I think, taciturnity. So it, it almost reads like Romans 1. He's saying uh, that mm -hmm. people were proud of their, what they should have been shameful of. Um, and uh, and he, he roots it, though, in something I think we're not used to rooting it in, as uh, people who just grew up in the church, and if that's, and I'm talking about the evangelical church in America, if all they're ever exposed to is, is that teaching and they haven't been exposed to let's say a wider range of philosophy and i think there's a simple explanation that's right that we all have which is that men love evil right and that that could easily explain all this but the, me the very mechanism or the justification man's using to promote this evil even without knowing that he's doing this perhaps is is fascinating to watch play out over centuries and that's what weaver gives us is this time frame it does so um Chapter two, uh, he gets into hierarchy, distinction and hierarchy. And to me, this chapter two is, this is in every chapter, really, this point, because he's always coming back to hierarchy and how we've abandoned that to our own peril. He argues that, um, let me pull this up for everyone too, so everyone can see this. He argues that the elimination of distinctions in the name of justice produces a society of consumers reduced to their economic interest. This in turn reduces the role of the state to promoting economic activity. Pragmatism serving comfort just becomes the highest moral justification. And the result is the elimination of public trust and loyalty. Weaver writes, people do not know what to expect of one another. Leaders will not lead and servants will not serve. This creates opportunities for resentment. Weaver teaches that fraternity and aristocracy are necessary for social harmony. If you don't have those, you don't have harmony. Equality is not enough, in other words. He said, um, today, he says, this aristocracy is sought through education. So ed they don't, they say they're for equality, but education uh, is the, 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 um, the instrument that gives us a new elite. So if you can pay all this money and go into debt and then get, uh, you know, go to the Ivy Leagues and get into the group of people who are also educated, you can 
that's how you transcend. And um, it's no longer, though, education focused on per perfecting man as a spiritual being, but preparing him to live successfully. And this produces an elite class who fail to develop the arist aristocratic virtues that used to exist. Weaver again argues that people must regain a metaphysic that expresses purpose beyond the consumption of economic man. This will ensure the possibility of liberty and the hope of personal improvement. So a lot to unpack in this chapter. Um, I was going to ask you, David, first, though, because there's so much about education. Um, what did you think? Because uh, I think it's on page 45. He's got this whole description of what modern schools are like. And uh, do you know where I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking now. He says, um, let's see if I can find the exact. He says, they've built new, uh, I'll start earlier. Americans certainly cannot be reproached for failing to invest adequately in the hope that education would prove a redemption. They have built numberless high schools, lavish in equipment, only to see them under the prevailing schemes of values turned into social centers and institutions for improving the personality where teachers living in fear of constituents dare not enforce scholarship. <laughs> they have built colleges on an equal scale, only to see them turned into playgrounds for grown-up children or centers of vocationalism and professionalism. Finally, they have seen pragmatists as if in peculiar spite against the very idea of hierarchy endeavoring to turn classes into democratic forums where the teacher is only a moderator and no one offends by presuming to speak with superior knowledge. That's 1948. Yeah, that's incredible, yeah. It's, it's, it's another one of those... You know, how, how could he possibly have seen this at that point when you're juxtaposing it with with today? But I think he hits the nail on the head when he, you know, a little bit earlier in the chapter kind of talks about the um, the replacement of a metaphysical reality of a, you know, a sort of a, a grander vision of the purpose of life. Um, and we're going to replace that with education. You know, education is a, and it's not just replacing it with education, it's replacing it with mass education, because, you know, I mean, I work, I live in Tennessee now, I work in Tennessee, there's a lot of differences, uh, there's a lot of cultural differences, um, but yet when you go into the school, there are a lot of similarities, and most things, you know, even in, like in my particular field, all you do is, is you just replace some acronyms, you know, so like in New York, my field is called ENL, but in Tennessee, it's called ELL. That's pretty much it. Other than that, it pretty much follows the same uniform um, uh, plan. And it's, it's, it's failed. It's, 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 it's a complete failure, uh, not, not on an individual level. I, don't, I wouldn't say that at all. There's lots of great teachers, and I'd like to think that I'm a decent teacher, and I can make somewhat of a difference. But if you look at the whole thing uh, in mass, the, and the failure is two part. One is... Um, it's been a failure of actually imparting useful knowledge to to generations that are coming up. It's and that's that's really the disease of um, uh, of making everything about identity, personal identity. Um, I think the the word he uses later is ego, egotism, like being egotists, but um, sort of training that into uh, generations that come up. And then the other uh, the other failure would just be because of the lack of any reality beyond, you know, we all come in here and we're going to sort of check our, um, you know, our metaphysical realities at the door. So it doesn't matter. We're, we're all, this is democratic. We're all just going to be, you know, we're going to agree that we don't agree on those things, but we're going to, um, where we have this one goal that we're all going to move toward. It's, it's education. What does that mean? What, what, is it, does that mean anything? What, education towards what? And it goes back to what he calls in the introduction, the Whig theory of history, that you are all moving in a direction of progress, but nobody knows what progress is. Nobody can define where the, the, the final destination is. And when you don't have that, you have nothing. You have basically just a crumbling, you know, a train that the wheels are slowly rusting and, and falling apart. And it's gonna, eventually it's gonna just run off the rails. You might argue it already has, um, but- He says yeah, progress basically justifies everything in the forties and, and nothing's really changed in that regard. We still, we don't maybe use the word progress as much, but that notion is still there that uh, every innovation that the left wants to foist upon society is justified because this is how we get ahead. This is uh, the um, sometimes progress is used or they'll just say uh, this is because we are moving towards greater equity, diversity, inclusion. So um, 
democracy is another one, right? No, no one can really tell you exactly. Th these words are just kind of weaponized and used, but they're not, uh, they're not defined, not precisely at least. So, um, I'd be curious, uh, dad, what you think, cause you, uh, you've been in the ministry for over 30 years. Uh, you've watched people get married and, um, you know, go through counseling situations and, um, just, you've seen the changes that have happened. And Weaver, when he talks about how people do not know what to expect of one another, I'm thinking it's not just bosses and employees, it's, um, women and men, you know, how do you go from, I like you to, I'm going to marry you like that. There's so much confusion about that because all the standards that once existed, that organized and facilitated that kind of relationship are gone. And so people, there's a lot of insecurity, I think, because of this. There's a lot of people are afraid to go on dates. They're afraid to go in, in social situations. They don't know how to, because there's no uh, propriety. There's no uh, courtliness, I guess. There's, you know, they don't even know to open doors for women and that kind of thing. So uh, what do you think of that? Well, uh <clears throat> Yeah, don't ask a preacher those kind of questions. <laughs> you want to keep this short. Um, the thing is, several things in there. One of the things that I'm going to step one step back here. He runs through this. I think that fits in this is the materialistic idea of what progress is. Is as long as you're gaining more and there's more technology and all that, that's part of what progress is, and therefore that's superior. And therefore, education is to train you to be able to be the cog in the corporate wheels so you can make a lot of money rather than training you to understand what life is about so that you can make wise decisions so it's a broad education or at least that used to be so you can understand the world god has made and be able to function and think properly towards things and that then definitely figures into what you're just talking about is how do males and females even relate to each other when it comes to dating and then thinking about marriage they don't have any idea anymore because they don't know what marriage is about um we become a sexualized society thinking that it's just about um having some fun or something and realizing there's actually a purpose that god has for it and your marriage is about children and a stability of a family to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the lord of what their purpose of existence is in glorifying him uh, that there are guides lines that he's given to us as well as commands specific ones on how to treat one another so when you're looking at i think the confusion you're talking about that exists today weaver seems to have had a be prescient uh, prescient prescient yeah i, yeah, I prescient. can't say the word either <laughs> very prescient um, toward what is end up coming and it includes all those things this distinction about who you are and a hierarchy within it um <clears throat> we destroyed it and so the men have no idea how to treat a woman because there's one side of society that's saying it's all about you know get her to go to bed with you and the other side is don't you dare treat her as a sex object and don't you dare say anything that might uh say that she's a weaker vessel as first peter does uh don't say anything like that because you're going to destroy you so the guy is left, he doesn't know what to do, so he does nothing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to get married, and marriage rates, you know, average age of first marriage keeps going up because the guy doesn't know what to do. And then the woman's complaining because when she gets the guy, uh, finally, he's just a big boy, and he doesn't know what it means to be a man because we no longer define those things. Right. We have a society that is degenerating to the point that we're so against a established hierarchy that actually originates from God and it would be expressed in societies and uh, history and in other nations in different ways, but there is a hierarchy that God has created and man is rejecting that. And so everybody's supposed to be equal, but yet they're not equal. And, and, and you see this everywhere because <laughs> in evangelicalism, this is so prevalent when the role of the pastor even gets reduced to like, I'm just call me Bob or something and I'm your buddy. And yeah. There's no respect that comes with that office. And not that you don't want to respect where you're, you're just bullying people, obviously. Some people can use that, and some people associate that with hierarchy. And Weaver actually talks about that later, how this is going to the, the modernity <clears throat> and the rejection of these absolutes will end up with a bunch of bullies, basically. And then people think that's what hierarchy is. And, and no, there's, there's a proper hierarchy. It used to exist. I think of um, 
with uh, a book I like to read by Washington Irving, Old Christmas, or even people who you know watched mm -hmm. Downton Abbey, same thing. It's like there there were, were stations in life that people held, and they knew how to treat others based upon their role, and so they were all working towards this common end. Where whereas now it's uh, people want to the everything else to work for them and their benefit, and it's not fair that there's any you know people that are over others or uh, we, we should all be kind of flatlined. And, um, and so I don't know, I just, I, I see this everywhere and I see the church, the evangelical church in particular, attacking this concept of hierarchy themselves. And they, they like to dance around the edge and say, well, you know, Paul says women can't be preacher, but, uh, didn't say that she can't be the head of our deacon board or something <laughs> like it's, it's crazy. Um, they, they fail to see what Weaver's saying is that there's, there's a design behind all this. And if you fail to recognize uh, the, the principles that tie everything together and categorize everything and create these boundaries, then you will just be uh, lost at sea. And that's what I think yeah. young men are. That's where they are. And they're the worst in, in a way, in the worst position, because they're told basically that they're terrible for being men. And at the same time, you know, they, um, they're they're told by others that they need to step it up and be a man and be self-sufficient and somehow navigate this world where they're supposed to find a wife, supposed to find a job, supposed to live. And no one's reaching out to, well, in some circumstances, tell them how to do it. Um, so anyway, I, I, I just think so many examples came to my mind that I couldn't figure out how would Weaver in 1940s see the social breakdown, but he did. He so. did. And I, I think there was a reason for it because after 19... Well, after World War, you saw somebody started talking about World War One. After World War Two, you have women go to work. The men are out fighting uh, the war. The women are at work. They're no longer at home. The war ends, and after World War One, the women went back home. After World War Two, the women stayed in the workforce because we're in a progress toward, hey, I can make more money. Uh, this is good. I've had my independence now for you know four years, five years, and I don't necessarily need the man. Uh, to provide everything. And so there was uh, more direction. So there were some clues going this direction, but he still, you know, I see things from a theological standpoint. He sees from a philosophical, and it really is interesting reading him to see how his philosophical basis, which actually still is grounded on a theology, uh, could see what was coming as he's just watching in society. And this was definitely one of them, this, um, absence of hierarchy, he ends up talking about a lot about aristocracy and um, <clears throat> those people who are in those positions were trained to be able to handle the responsibilities that were going to be under them. They had to think differently. It wasn't a, it's all about me. I mean, certainly there were exceptions, they were just selfish people. But overall, they were trained to understand that they had people they had to be responsible for uh, and had to watch out for them. And so it was other-centered, not self-centered. Uh, yet those under them understood that the success of the whole was going to be because they were part of something greater than themselves. And that's being lost other than, I, you know, you started talking about education. The specialist, he's going to get into that later too. Um, you know, we all kowtow to whoever the specialist is supposed to be, but the specialist doesn't know what he's talking about because he can't relate it. Yeah to the other areas of life. And that's part of this hierarchy thing. Uh, the hierarchy that used to exist was because the person who was in that position actually had a greater, broader understanding um, of everything. I think he calls it uh, centritism or something like that. He understood what was there, whereas we become so specialized, we don't know where we fit. So there is no hierarchy except in your one little specialized thing and you think that's everything about life and it's not so it just cascades into everything and so you're right what you said about young men now is they're completely lost they have no idea where they're supposed to fit what are they supposed to do yeah um what does it mean to be a man if they strive toward manliness they're attacked if they don't do you know other things then they're attacked for that and so they stand there with their hands in their pockets knowing what to do well it's ironic because they can <clears throat> they can go into the video game world and a lot of these video yeah. games um will implement some kind of a structure in this fanciful world so they're it like my wife and i were watching lord of the rings last night and i, I had the same thought i was like it's so funny that this is popular because this is a world of um of lines <laughs> of there's there's nobility 
there, there's all kinds of different kinds of people that have different places and strengths and weaknesses, and they have to form this fellowship to destroy a ring. And the only way they can do it is working together because they're all different. And there's no leveling egalitarian. And I mean, the end of it is, you know, a guy becomes a king. Uh, the man, uh, the you know, Aragon becomes a king. This is all fantasy, but if we were to take some of those principles to apply to our own world, we would be bigots immediately. Um, and, but yet in fantasy, we're still allowed to enjoy those things. And so is, isn't it ironic that so many men play video games, fantasy games, games about, well, you there's, know, if you think about it, there's really, there's really three acceptable ways of being a man in our day and age. You can drink beer, you can watch sports or play sports. If you're a little bit more aggressive and you can play video games. Those are those are the acceptable forms of being a man. And I, I don't know, this is probably a good segue into chapter three, because that's exactly what he's talking about here. Right. But when he traces the, I, I feel like I got the most out of chapter three. When he traces, um, he, in the, he says in the middle of ages, um, the ideal man, he calls the philosophic doctor. So um, right. there's a lot, exactly. I don't know, there's a lot of... There's a lot of different people you could think about, but I actually kind of thought about Martin Luther, even though he's he's sort of towards the end of the Middle Ages. Um, Martin Luther has something to say about everything, but he's also a man of action. So he's, you know, he obviously is kind of influential in starting a movement, but he's also, he's widely read, he's widely, he writes widely, he's a debater, he debates people in person, um, and he's, he's, he's a varied man. He's, he's more, he's, you can't boil him down to just one thing as opposed to a specialization um, applied to, to, to the man, right? You have your one job, and then when you come home, the way to express your manliness is, man, you can have a, you can have a six pack and you can watch the game. And that's, that's what it means to be a man, you know? And you're also kind of dumb, but it's funny. And that's basically what it means to be a man. And that's such a juxtaposition of really what an ideal man was. He says, um, Milton's ideal of the educated man who is ready to perform all duties, both public and private, of peace and of war. So the, in the past, the, I, the ideal man is a, basically the, gen, the gentleman warrior, right? So you are, um, you know, you're talking about Lord of the Rings, which you're kind of going back to the days of knights. That's, I guess, the, the aesthetic. Um, but you are, you are you're skilled in combat. You know, um, you know how to organize men uh, to achieve a goal. But then you're also... Um, you're also kind of meek, you know, you are, you're, uh, you're kind and gentle to your wife and with your children. So you have these simultaneous, these simultaneous natures that God gave you to be like the nurturer and provider, but you're also a warrior. You're ready to go, um, you know, you're ready to go to battle as soon as the threat arises. And to me, this is basically the, this is how <laughs> applying it personally, this is the alienation that men feel in the evangelical world and in the conservative world, because, and and I, I think that's why this book is worth reading in a way, because it kind of it kind of uh, uh, underpins those um, those the the lack of you know the presentation of what it really means to be a man in the evangelical world. You kind of get that, you know, drink beer and watch sports. And that's it. That's, that's what it means to be a man. And then the conservative world, like the academic conservative world of today, it's really like, well, you know, we're, we're capitalists and you have your special job and you fit into the economy and it's free market. And that's kind of it. And it doesn't really go beyond that. But I think Weaver's kind of showing that there, there, there was, and there is a, there is a better way of being a man that is actually more fulfilling. Yeah. Some of that, I think, you could easily tie in uh, to the Southern agrarian idea of what life really is about, and agrarians understood it. It's more about living life in God's world and understanding it and enjoying it and uh, being grateful for it and having a broad knowledge of many things rather than what we've ended up with uh, in, in cities and uh, where you're a, a cog in a corporate wheel and it's just, I go to work, I do this one little thing there and I go home and then uh, what am I experiencing? You know, I, I can experience by watching the idiot box on, you know, uh, television or something like that, rather than actually going out and, ex uh, and in God's creation is doing something. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is definitely a tie that he has into these uh, Southern agrarians. And it starts showing up in all these kinds of things. He understood what life was about. He understood what a, and we're talking about being a man or something, he understood it because it was part of 
you know, his own upbringing in the South, um, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, North Carolina yeah, and then Louisville. North, North Carolina, so. Louisville, Kentucky, yeah. and um, I guess being brought up by a Mississippian myself and, and the things he instilled into me, which I tried to instill into you, were against that kind of, um, I guess, fragmentation that goes into us. It's this there is a hierarchy and it ultimately goes back to God and I'm going to be under him. I, that, that it has to be there. It can't be defined by a society that doesn't even know what it exists for anymore, other than we're just going to make more wealth and those who have more wealth will make more wealth and those who don't have it, they'll yeah. want it. And, well, you know, there's a, uh, that stuff. There, there's a small town. Um, I mean, I think you do see this expressed in some of the movies David mentioned earlier from Frank Capra. There, there's a uh, yeah. you, you, uh, sense in which, um, you know, who your family is, uh, and they've gone back generations. They have an investment in the land. So you have a tie to the land. So people know who you are, not just because of your life, but also the lives of others who, um, sacrifice yeah, exactly. to give you your life. And, and vice versa. So you, you know them in relation to uh, their the, what their contributions to the community and over the span of generations. And so when it comes time to choose a leader, even if it's not a formal <laughs> choosing in a political setting, but actually a uh, simply just who do we respect, you're not looking for the person that has the biggest bank account necessarily. Um, that could mean that they're a wise steward of their money, but it may not be. <laughs> they could be the city person who moved in who has no tie to the land and doesn't want to talk to anyone. That, that They're not getting respect because they have money. Um, it's not because you have the highest level of education. Even though there's some respect that can come with that if you worked hard to get there and gain some good knowledge, uh, it's more the investment that you've put in over the long haul. And that's the kind of world Weaver, I think, fell in love with. And that's what got him out of socialism was he... He realized there was this decadence to the um, the world that he lived in that was just reduced everyone to an economic consumer. Uh, at least that's what he, or when we get to the stereoptagon, we'll talk about it. He felt like um, that there needed to be an alternative to this. And so when he was young, he turned to socialism as that was going to be the thing. But then he realized that that, that created, that, that was actually a byproduct of the same thing. Like bourgeois capitalism and socialism mm -hmm. both reduced man to an economic, um, and these are his terms. Uh, consumer and and he wanted he, it, it's it's ideology it's narrow and he he saw man as so much wider so in the chapter three which is what we've been talking about he argues that rejecting transcendentals destroys the possibility of wisdom and traps people in the present man narrows his focus from pursuing truth to pursuing facts this destroys the outmoded hierarchy that once honored the philosopher and then the gentleman by re replacing it with one that comprises itself of specialists on the, and he call he says this on the borderline of psychosis. Um, and I have a picture of Anthony Fauci. Everyone can, uh, in fact, I'll put it <laughs> up here. Cause I'm like, that's the epitome of it. It's that, that's what we all did in 2020. We, oh, well, he's a specialist. You can't question him. He's an idiot. Um, but uh, <laughs> this metric prohibits value judgments. This in turn emasculates men through multiculturalism. It's funny how he predicted the political correctness we're dealing with. He said, you can't, criticize anyone from another culture uh, that encourages emotional instability in urban living where workers are confined to small tasks creates a small group of elites who manage a mass of workers and leads to moral horrors and he talks about this when, in relation to what we did uh, with the manhattan project and what the nazis did in just saying well i'm i'm part of like the moral accountability doesn't apply to me if i'm a low-level worker it only applies to the person at the top because they're the specialists. They're like the prophets from on high who tell us what to do. Um, and so he says, his conclusion is wisdom does not lie on the periphery. Uh, instead, we need to get back to revering the philosophers over the specialists. And, and I should just say real quick, he doesn't mean philosophers like go to your local college and find the philosophy department. He means something different. No. He means the, uh, it, we would think of it today more as the Renaissance man kind of idea. So, someone who um, is wise. Wisdom is what he's talking about. The person who would, you know, be described as, as a Solomon. Solomon would be the epitome of this, the philosopher king. So um, anyway, that's that's what he argues. And um, let's see, I have questions written out for all of these. I've been ignoring it. But how would this impact um, hiring uh, who we, I don't even know what I wrote here, scribbles. How would we, this impact hiring and who we trust? So um, I think what I'm trying to say there is 
uh, when you're hiring for a company today, it, they look for certain things. They make a lot of short-term decisions, I've noticed, just in my experience. And they, they're not hiring. They don't have a metric based upon someone's in character, responsibility. It's like, what level of education did you get to, right? And, and um, maybe what experience did you have at a previous job? But that's it. And character means so, so much more. Nurturing the, those eternal qualities is going to make you a better worker. And so um, would you hire the specialist, right? Or would you rather hire the person who can think for themselves? <laughs> and, and so maybe we could get the discussion started with that. Who would you... If you're, Are we talking about my job or... <laughs> well, it's a, yeah, I know. We're talking about every job, right? That's what he's... Because if I had somebody to hire, I'd probably hire the specialist because I don't want somebody... You know, I just want them to follow the bureaucratic rules. Well, you're ruining my. Uh... I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're... That's what he lives in. You know, you have a specialist. But the, um, the idiot who can't think out of the narrow box that. Well, he's... I would never hire the specialist. No, absolutely not. I would. You'd want to know that somebody. I so can if I can just really quick. I mean, and this is not a knock. I have a lot of friends who do this for um, a living, and. They're, you know, smarter than me and, you know, are going to make way more money. But um, coding, right? So coding is um, kind of the, what, what, what's the saying? Learn to code, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so coding is, you know, you sit at your computer and you're kind of figuring puzzles out and writing um, software language and stuff, right? And you can get paid a lot to do this um, and you can just be at home doing it. And that's, you know, really cool for a lot of people. Um, I think it's in chapter four, he kind of gets into this, but um, he talks about how there's been a shift from uh, in work, right? So if you're just working for the, um, for the consumption of whatever it is that you're making, I think the example he uses is a chair. Like if you're just, if you're making the chair for somebody to consume the chair, to use it, then um, you, there is, there's no, um, there's no hierarchical, higher, higher, I teach, I teach English. We're having a lot of a hard times here pronouncing stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I can say it in Spanish better. Um, there's no, uh, th that there's no hierarchical aspect in <clears throat> your, your work. Right. So that's, that would be juxtaposed to, um, you're putting excellence into the particular thing that you're doing. You're, you're doing it because you actually have a higher, um, you know, you have a higher goal, right? And, um, you know, it relates to the scripture, do everything heartily as to the Lord and not for men. Uh, but we kind of, you know, <laughs> I, I always think of the, um, like all those, uh, the pictures you'll see on social media of, uh, you know, churches today versus, um, you know, Renaissance churches and stuff. And the way that this is kind of outflowed in architecture and, and um, different mediums to where like the work is, is just for whoever's going to come and consume it. Right. But then work has sort of gotten boiled down to, you know, it's not even sound, even physical, tangible anymore. Now it's, you're just doing a task on a computer for somebody to, and even that now is going to be probably taken over by, by AI. Um, a lot of that work. And so then we're left with just the question, what is work? What is it for? What's the point? What's the purpose? And you get back to these fundamental <clears throat> questions about why we're doing what we're doing to begin with. Um, you do remember what Joshua did to AI. I'm sorry, is that the logical joke? Uh, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Took me a second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, there are places for a specialist, but the specialist doesn't understand the general things behind it. They become foolish. And he does point that out. They become so specialized in something, they don't understand how it fits together. And so you end up with real problems. And we certainly see that in our day and age to a, a, a huge degree, um, <clears throat> we've created, he taught, you know, the philosophy doctor, that's not an equivalent to the PhD of today. That was someone who was trained in a lot of different areas and could to help you transition to see how it fit into, I would, you know, he was referring to the metaphysical, um, it would be the theologians, theologians as well. We now have specialists that don't understand what got them to that specialty. Certainly, you want a specialist if you have a particular disease. You want to talk to someone who knows something about that disease and how to treat it properly and what's known about it and all that. That's helpful. 
but the specialist is never the, going to be the one that actually got you to finally, you know, to move you toward that diagnosis. That's going to gen be the general practitioner who has a wide array of knowledge and can point you the direction you need to go. And that might be a good analogy of some of the stuff he's talking about here is that we, if as society, and he's looking for seeing where this is going to go, we're now living what he was foreseeing. You have all these specialists who get a high degree of uh, attention or uh, <clears throat> weight in their argument because they have whatever degree or they're specialists in this. But as you point out, what Dr. Fauci is supposed to be the specialist, but the man was a fool. He had no understanding of what he was doing, how it affected economics. Then you find out he's a liar. He admits it. You find out it really comes back down to him and his ego. And yet he's accorded all this uh, weight in his uh, opinions because of his position. And no, it was the common doctor who was fighting COVID and helping people to live and not losing patients. And I think that's a probably good analogy for where he was, Weaver's actually looking to, this is where we're going to go and we're in it. I think that's why you mentioned Fauci earlier, Jonathan, is that this yeah. is a, the epitome of a guy that demonstrates the foolishness of our society. Who would I hire? It depends on what it's doing. If for a church, I'd always want the generalist. Yeah. I don't want a guy who's so good at preaching, he doesn't know how to pastor, doesn't know how to deal with people, doesn't know how to counsel them or comfort them. You know, okay, he's a pulpiteer, he's an oratician, wonderful, but that's not what God calls to do. He's called pastors to be pastors, teachers, to equip the the church for the you know the saints for the, the work of the ministry, not just be an oratician so he can gain a lot of uh, followers on the, in the media or something. It, but that starts becoming what we end up doing, uh, even in something like ministry. If you have someone who's building a house. Yeah, you appreciate that there's somebody who's really good at plumbing and you have a plumber, but the plumber better know something about the rest of the structure of the house or he's going to start cutting through uh, <clears throat> supporting studs in order to put his pipe in to collapse the house. So they have to have a general knowledge too. And I, Weaver makes a good case for that of yeah. the importance of that and what the danger is, is that uh, the direction we're going and that we are now in. Um, yeah, no, he he is very uh, prophetic in that respect. Um, I thought we were going to get through uh, probably six chapters, but we've only gone through uh, three so far, and um, I think I think we're gonna <laughs> stop it there, and uh, and then we can we can talk about what we've already talked about some more. But um, since there's nine chapters, maybe I'll have to do three uh, episodes or something. Um, we have uh, 88 people streaming right now. I, I want to open it up for, and, and by the way, uh, you, if you need to go, Dad or David, um, it's totally fine. I'm going to open it up, though, for people okay. who are patrons right now, if they have a question or if they have um, a comment about this, and we'll just give each one of them uh, a I, few minutes. I'll just add this really quick. You go know, ahead. What, what we have talked about so far, we've only scratched the surface of what this guy has said. I know. I, would, I do highly recommend the book. There are weaknesses in it. Um, you know, we could point those out, but if you want to kind of understand where we are as society, this is a very good book to read. And his last chapters, though, I have to admit are a little confusing and I have to reread them again to understand kind of what he was really uh, yeah. talking about. Um, he gives some very good things about what, how do we get back to where we need to be? So uh, yeah. again, I thank you for recommending the book to me and I've enjoyed reading it. Well, we'll do more of this. Uh, you're welcome, Lord willing, when, um, when when I find some other books. In fact, there's a number of them I'm already thinking of, but um, I want to introduce <clears throat> some good books to people because we get so much junk out there. And I, I've noticed, too, a lot of Christians tend to be insular in their uh, whatever, not even denomination. It's like the evangelical guild, I guess. And we have the, the books that Lifeway and um, you know, these other big publishers produce. And I want to just give you some some really good books that will um, that that aren't you know cheap. They're not fluffy. They're not uh, shallow. They're deep and uh, they're rich, and they'll change the way that you even think about things uh, for the better. And I think uh, Rich Weaver's books are like that. Ideas of Consequences uh, being one of them. All right. Well, let's um let's transition. Can I just plug really, really, really quick. 
So yep. just before before we go um, to, to the to questions, just as like a personal plug for this book, this book like revolutionized my own understanding of kind of where I stood within like conservatism and um, where where I was going like politically because I realized that something was missing, something was wrong with um, kind of I guess not what I had been taught at home dad but <laughs> what i had kind of um where i gravitated were a lot of the sources that i kind of ended up yeah. um yeah. getting like how how they were in it affecting me and impacting me and that there was more so one of the one of the biggest reasons for reading it is if you feel like this there's something's off something's wrong like I, this is very empty you know i whatever it listening to talk radio or um, like reading the fluffy evangelical books. It's a good place. It's a good book to start, to just start identifying like where, where, do, where, where is this wrong? Like, where do we go wrong? What's missing from this picture? And I think it's helpful in that way. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Um, all right. Well, let's transition since it's already 924 here. Uh, Barbara, Barbara Asabri. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, uh, name right. I'm just giving you a little bit of a, a heads up before I <laughs> press admit here. Um, there's a number of people in the queue here, so um, hopefully we can, uh, I'll stay here as long as I need to, but um, this is for patrons, and again, we're going to still live stream, but for the patrons who want to come on, all right, I'm uh, admitting Barbara now and seeing what she has to say, um, you know. It, uh, Barbara, Barbara. Oh, Barbara, turn off your uh, live stream while we're talking here. We'll see if she comes back and uh, give her a minute here. But um, yeah, one of the things you were just talking about uh, that you feel like disconnected or isolated. Um, the, the way I phrase that is I felt like there was no one representing me. Like I couldn't find a voice hardly anywhere, even in political conservatism that represented my interests. And I want to defend, um, the things that matter to me. That's, I think what we all want. We all, there, there's things that matter to us and they're not all abstractions. There's ways of life that we live in and we think they're worthy of defending. And it, it even comes down to cuisines, right? It comes, the lobster fisherman in Maine, right? Is he upset that the windmills are going to come in and ruin his lobster fishing? Yeah, but it's not just because it's an economic thing of like, well, I'm not going to be able to make money or something. It's cultural. It's cultural. I'm a lobster fisherman. I've been that for, uh, my, my parents were lobster fishermen. This is our way of life. You're not destroying my means of income. You're destroying my entire identity. Not entire, but, you know, a big part of it. And we see in the Old Testament, I think, safeguards for this kind of thing. That's why the land goes back to the uh, tribes, right? After 70 years of Jubilee, um, it's, it's um, I don't know, it, it's just, there's an assumption that p people take pride in their work. The craftsmen who went to the temple, right? Um, they weren't just doing it because they're getting a paycheck. They're doing it because this is my purpose in life. Don't take away my purpose. Uh, and, and that's what Weaver gives us. And that's what a lot of modern conservative uh, pundits, unfortunately, don't. And especially the more libertarian-minded ones. Um, all right, we'll see. Bar Barbara, are you there? Let's see if I can. I'm asking to unmute here. Barbara? <laughs> all right, we're going to... Um, I'm going to see if maybe we can uh, have someone else come in. I'm sorry, Barbara. I'm not... Uh, hearing you um all right we're gonna go to um mike i think uh, mike so get ready mike at the microphone mike can you hear me all right we'll wait a second uh with him and uh see if he comes on um but anyway uh, other thoughts that you've had as we've gone through this uh these first th uh, three chapters Hierarchy, um, education, we've talked about the roles of men and women to some extent. Um, uh, well, maybe one caution. He, he, he speaks a, quite a bit against science. And I would just say it's, the caution is this. He's actually speaking against scientism, the philosophical aspect of science. Uh, a proper understanding of science does increase your overall knowledge, but you still have the same problem. You become just specialized in one position and don't understand how all the different sciences work together, you're probably going to have a trouble. That was just one thing I kept seeing throughout it. He mm -hmm. He's using the one term, but what he's really talking about is the, the sci scientism, the philosophy behind uh, a uh, materialism rather than 
science as the Christians were pursuing it, the founders of many fields of science of understanding God and his creation that we may uh, fit in with his creation better uh, because right. we are stewards of it. Mike, can you uh, hear me? <clears throat> are you there? I don't hear Mike. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to have to come up with a better software. I'm using Zoom for this, which is what I'm used to, but um, some people recommend StreamYard and other services and Maybe that's what I'm going to have to do. Um, all right. Well, uh, Evan, <laughs> Evan, get ready because I'm coming to you next. Um, well, other other things that Weaver, uh, you know, mentions in other works have been profound to me. Um, Evan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, we have. Ha, it does work. All right. <laughs> Let me try and silence you guys. then. <laughs> Don't silence us. Well, yeah, he means on the YouTube stream. I should probably silence myself. And, you know, Barbara just mentioned in the chat that she goes, I am here. So I don't, Barbara, I'm sorry. If you want to come back in the waiting room, we can try again. But um, so, Evan, what's on your mind? So, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, really enjoy it. I, this is a book that I very much appreciate. Um, I guess one of the one of the big takeaways that I had when I read this book was Weaver talks a lot about what he calls universals. And what he means by that is these transcendentals that exist outside of human experience, right? That are like universally true, that um, like are aspects of, of God's character, for example, that um, are uh, con supposed to be controlling um, our worldview. But what's interesting about that is uh, a lot of the people who want to deny these universals tend to sort of universalize humanity. And there's, there's, there almost seems to be a connection there between hmm. this universalizing of humanity and refusing to acknowledge these universals that exist outside of humanity. And I, I haven't quite been able to put my finger on it yet, but and clearly Weaver does not do that. He recognizes, like you guys were saying, these hierarchies, these distinctions between human beings. I, so I don't know, John, if you have any thoughts about that, why that might be the case. Are you saying that he, um, that people who reject these universal absolutes, uh, intangible things that he, uh, what does he call them, transcendentals, that they instead impose that on humanity itself, you mean? That they, that's a globalist Precisely. instinct? Okay. Yeah, so, so they tend to when you reject these ex things that are exterior to human beings you tend to, to sort of want to flatten humanity itself to make all human beings the same okay um, yeah no you're, you're saying that humanity becomes an abstraction at that point right yes. exactly yeah exactly yeah no i totally agree with that humanity is for, for the modern left and unfortunately now for even elements of the right when they talk about people you can hear it even in their language they um they can talk about, um, you know, world peace or something like that, like uh, wanting to bring about some, you know, what's the song uh, that they do? Um, there's Imagine. a, well, Imagine's one of them. There, there's an, there's the one that Michael Jackson did years ago too that come, keeps coming up. We, uh, are the world. we are the world, yeah. And it's just like, I mean, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not the world, actually. You're, you're a person in a particular place. There is a particularness to this. But the, the way that particulars can relate to one another, which we're all particulars, is that there's certain things that we have in common. The number one thing being the image of God, or the fact that we're sinners, we're in need of salvation. Um, but when it comes to like things like language and culture um, and lineage and you know all these very tangible things that are part of God's created order, we don't have those in common with each other, and they create barriers. And guess what? They're supposed to, to some extent. It doesn't mean barriers in a bad sense. It just means... Like, like we have borders around our country and the globalists do seem to want to reduce man down to something so uh, abstract and basic that um, none of those barriers ought to exist. And there should be, um, they won't tell you this because it's in the name of equality, but they want to have a global hierarchy where the, their specialists are in charge of the whole world. And, and that will prevent the bigotries of nationalism and, um, you know, other local bigotries from... You know, what, what do you guys think? I mean, that's my take on it. He mentions this. Weaver mentions this directly in chapter three. He says, since liberalism became a kind of official party line, we have been enjoined against saying 
things about races, religions, or national groups, for after all, there's no categorical statement without its implication of value, and values begin divisions among men. We must not define, subsume, or judge. We must rather rest on the periphery and display sensibility towards the cultural expression of all lands and people. And then he says, this is a process of emasculation. So when you remove those distinctions, you've now, you've now emasculated, you've taken away all the oomph from, you know, from yourself as an individual within, you know, a, a context. Yeah. yeah. If you can't honor your fathers and your your lineage, those who will come after you, who will share your your tight your your way of life, then you don't have a society because society is a communion of the living and the dead and those yet to be born, right? So um, that's a good point, uh, Dad. You have anything on that or no? No, uh, okay. David <laughs> he read the quote. The same passage I was looking at. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Evan. I appreciate you. Uh, that's a good point, and I'll have to chew some more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'm going to come to Earl next, I think. Uh, if Earl is there. Earl, just get ready. He's about to join us. Um, yeah, that's it, the globalists are probably like the specialists and globalists run together. <laughs> like every specialist wants to be a global elite of some kind, like. Um, they, they don't just have loyalties or responsibilities, duties to their particular context, local area people, uh, marriage duties, maybe even they want to, um, they want to sweep the fortunes of other people and that, and they take, um, I, I mean, I've seen this in, um, uh, you know, education context where professors tend to be, in my experience, the most insecure people I've ever met. And it's like, why you, you have all these degrees, but that's the only thing they have is this specialization. And they've sacrificed all these other things sometimes to get there that would normally confer identity in natural ways. Um, Earl, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, John. Hey, it's good to hear from you. Good to, to I, I was going to say, see you. You can turn on your mic if you want, but you don't have to. Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm on my couch wrapped in a blanket. So oh. not, not quite fit for video. I don't need any other details. So yeah, just <laughs> share the question. <laughs> or the comment. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for putting this together. This has been a, an edifying evening. Um, my question has to do with discerning between the legitimate hierarchies within life, right? The, the natural God-ordained hierarchies, like parents over children, let's say, and uh, what Thomas Jefferson called the aristocracy of merit, uh, versus arbitra purely arbitrary hierarchies such as, say, a hereditary monarchy, right? Because any time in a modern context, if I say that hierarchy isn't bad, that's immediately what the radical egalitarians run to. And I, I guess as, as I've been listening to this, uh, this dialogue with the three of you gentlemen, um, something that stuck out to me is that character is, is as important as competence. Hmm. So you, you have to have the Renaissance man, you have to have the well-rounded generalist, um, but if he doesn't have the integrity or the courage to use his knowledge, he's not really fitted for a leadership position. Yeah. And that seems to me to be one of the reasons why um, the radical egalitarians hate people like, say, George Washington or Robert E. Lee, because they weren't they weren't just competent. They they were uh, men of great character, too. And there's this it seems like there's this envy of, um, you know, Tennyson called it pairing the mountain to the plain to leave an equal baseness. Um, so I, I guess my, my question is how to respond to the radical egalitarian types on, um, you know, what, what qualifies someone to be at the top of a legitimate hierarchy? I'll keep my answer short. I mean, number one, um, I would point out hierarchy is inescapable. Even the radical egalitarians have a hierarchy, whether they admit it is a hierarchy or not, you know, that's up to them, I guess. But if they're being honest... They have to realize, especially if they're communist types, that at the top of their hierarchy are people or a government structure that includes people because there's no structure that doesn't have people 
that is going to have a godlike um, status. And so that's a hierarchy that's beyond anything that we've seen even in, I would say, natural aristocracies. Uh, and um, so what they're proposing is worse in its uh, capacity for abuse than anything that has come previous to this, an all-knowing state with the capacity to implement a social credit, and right? So you know where I'm going. Um, so, so, so I would say that first, that's my like critique of them. But second, I would just say that, um, you know, I, I think the, the, what we're arguing for is the fact that hierarchies do exist. Some of them, I think you, like you can't come and impose sometimes like an exact, this is what it should look like because it's going to be tailored to a situation. Like I've been in, um, social experiments where they did this when I was doing NAM training, you go into a room and they give you a task and there's like 10 people. Someone naturally arises to become the organizer of that task. It, it all, because the task has to get done and not every person can be a chief. You have to have a chief and in Indians. And if there's two chiefs, they duke it out, right? Or they figure out how to work together. So a hierarchy emerges even in that situation. And so some hierarchies I think are natural. Um, the divine right of Kings, that whole idea, that created the problems that led to things like I think World War One, and it. Um, I I mean I'm I'm not in favor of that. I understand there are people returning to that because they're seeing the failures of democracy, but um, I mean it's going to be there may I mean obviously crisis is going to come back. So we want um, something that's going to be suited for the population. If it's a population that's responsible, they don't need a king. If they're irresponsible right? Man, they, they may need some something to come and limit their evil decisions. And um, I mean, I, I think of the warnings that of, uh, Samuel made of having a king, but sometimes it, it is, um, it's necessary to, to limit decisions. So I, I, we want, in general, the principle is local control that's suited for the people and their needs and the level of responsibility they have in particular areas. And um, it's going to look different in different fields too, whether it's government or uh, ecclesiastical or whatever. So what, um, David or Dad, what do you think? Let me tell you about the glory of the British Empire. You are live. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> uh, yeah, I thought you'd go there. But, um, <laughs> what do you think, Dad? <clears throat> well, I'm a pastor, so I immediately go to First uh, Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and saying as God has already set forth certain qualities and he's spelled them out pretty clearly there. Um, even the Old Testament, you have the same kind of thing is there's character qualities. Even for elders, the character qualities are first and the abilities come second. And it's the character of the man that you need for any kind of hierarchy. And that's what you always should be looking for. Part of the problem of our uh, current republic is our degeneration of our po political system is that we're looking at specialists, the guy who's been in politics for a long time rather than the guy who is uh, demonstrated his character in business or, you know, whatever he was in, military guy or something. You should be looking for character in any field, first and foremost, for the, the person that's going to be uh, in the upper echelons of whatever organization it is, whether that's uh, national government, state governments, local governments, uh, in, a, in a business. You know, if you were responsible for hiring, you know, who's going to be the the guy who's going to be our girl who's running up to lead within that organization look for the character character qualities are listed out as what we should have one just one thing i would say um i mean this this isn't necessarily going to uh you know the promotion of a specific you know organizational structure of society but <clears throat> you know, for the radical egalitarian, we live, our society is radically egalitarian, and pretty much every institution promotes that idea. The only thing they haven't really successfully promoted is why that's good. Why is it good for people to rule? Why is it good, you know, voter franchise? Why is it good for everybody to, you know, um, Weaver, in his other book, The Ethics of Rhetoric, one of his big points is, um, you know, arguing from first principles. So uh, the argument from first principles would just be, all right, well, you know the people need to decide why why is that good you know try it with your you know i'm a teacher so try that with your students in class and see how that works out um you know why is that the best thing why, why is that a moral good and yeah work up from there i guess yeah, universal suffrage has not been a good idea it's been bad uh, because you get uh, an equal uh, weight of influence by those who are least capable or least knowledgeable or 
or have the, the most despondent character uh, to decide how things are supposed to be compared to those who have the greatest character and abilities. It's It's been bad. Yeah. And it was a bad idea. Uh, we had it right early on in the Constitution and continue to expand voting rights to anybody and everybody under the sun. That's been kind of based on the idea that the more people vote, the more the closer you should be to uh, what reality should be. And the reality is it's just it enables for a greater uh, aspect of a manipulation of uh, for popularity. So, you know, the most popular is the one who gets in the position rather than one who's actually competent in the military and history when the uh, troops would vote to uh, have their leader that didn't always work out so well. Uh, sometimes not any better or worse than a politician putting him in, but you need competence. Character is part of that. Well, um, I am going to thank you, by the way, uh, Earl. Um, we're going to switch to Hannah Smith now. And uh, Hannah, if you hear me, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Oh, you're going to show us your video. Thank hey. you for doing that. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. People don't have to do that, but uh, yeah. So, Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, see so you. yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Oh my gosh, so many. First was I my education is way lower quality than I ever expected because <laughs> I'm reading this. I'm like, who's that? What's that? What's that word? Oh, I have the but, same thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I no, had to read was, with a dictionary. It was <laughs> it was excellent though, and I actually enjoyed how he could condense such big thoughts in just a few words. <laughs> so um, I did want to I had two questions. The first one is I was just gonna preface with kind of a short commentary. I'll try to keep it short. But um, at the very end where he was talking about the positive aspects of what we can do, um, the second thing he, he talks about is language and, and words. And um, this paragraph stood out to me. He said, in recognizing that words have power to define and to compel, the semanticists are actually testifying to the philosophic quality of language, which is the source of their vexation. In an attempt to rid of that quality, they are looking for some neutral means, which will be a non-conductor of the current called emotion and its concomitant of evaluation. They are introducing into language in the course of their prescriptions exactly the same atomization which we have deplored in other fields. They are trying to strip words of all meaning that show tendency or they are trying to isolate language from the noumenal world by writing speech of tropes. And yeah. all I could think of was when um, I first started engaging in like the social justice conversation and I was working, I was working in law enforcement. So when I saw a lot of this stuff coming up, you know, I would, well, what do you mean by that? And what are your thoughts? And, you know, trying to engage in good faith with friends. And, um, you know, at first it kind of started as, oh, listen to our stories. Like, no, just like, we just want to express our stories. So I was like, okay, great. Tell me your story. And then you'd engage with the story. They say, no, 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 no. I just want you to listen. And then that very quickly turned into your silence is violence. You need to speak up. And then you'd speak up and participate in the conversation again, which would turn into those are the wrong things to say. Here's what you need to say. And, um, and then also what would happen, you know, so the language was always coerced. The definitions were always on their terms. But then also what would happen is there would be, and I know you've talked about this with like TGC and some of the other evangelical there's always this emphasis on we must define our terms, which can be very good and meaningful, but often it's like kind of plays into we can't understand one another unless I give you my very own specific definition to this conversation. So um, one of the things I remember kind of decisively trying to do when I was like, how do I even respond to this conversation? was I don't, I'm tired of equivocating. I'm tired of trying to speak to their emotion and trying to like lower down the emotion so we can have a conversation that's clearly just being manipulated. But I actually found like over time, I just lost the ability to even know how to speak directly. You know, it was almost like you lose that skill. So my first question was just, what advice do you have for people, you know, who are 
want to both um, like speak without equivocating and then just confident that what they're saying is true. I mean, obviously, like that has a spiritual dimension, too. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of times people tend I, I saw this, too. Um, I was joining like a lot of mom groups. I was a new mom at the time. And, you know, there's there's this idea of, well, no one can tell someone else what's true or what you can do. Right. It's whatever is best for yourself. So there's no common understanding. So how do we speak? How, how do we get better skilled at speaking truth and confidence in that it is truth? Well, That's you're the good. English major, David. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, well, I mean, I could, I can, I would just set that up for it because I feel like that's, I mean, as Christians, that's really where, that's where we shine the most because okay. we are rooted in specific language. So, mm. you know, I, I, I mean, think about the, if you think about the implications of AI, right? So now we're, we have a, we're in a position where, you know, if I want to, I can open a website and I can say, hey, write me an essay about Richard Weaver and it will produce a, you know, believable, yeah. essay that I could submit to my college professor and then you know they I probably could get away with it at this point um unless he has some software that can determine or detect that that's fake um and so what what we're probably on the precipice is at least what I assume we would be is just chaos of of learning and education because nobody will be able to verify not only whether something is original but what something means and um you know so definition I I your point about like your point about um always beginning an, a, a conversation or an article with definition. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, Doug Wilson does this a lot. And I don't mean that to pick on him, because I actually think he's very good at doing that. But, um, you know, the, the fact that it's... You know, the last time someone picked on Doug Wilson on this show... <laughs> I'm not picking on him. I'm not picking on him. He, I've, I've, I've gotten a lot from his stuff, partially because of, um, you know, providing a lot of answer, providing this, modeling this. Because um, in, no, in November, he doesn't do it. He just says, all right, we're not doing any more um, definitions. We're just going to go no quarter November. So, and that's the only time I generally read that stuff. Um, but we, you know, we're rooted in, um, we're rooted in, you know, in the Bible. So that's, that gives us a foundation that gives weavers sort of, I mean, that is the metaphysic um, because it's, it's, it is specific language. Um, it's it's the only uh, uh, solid rock in a stormy sea. So, Pastor, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it seems like I spend most of the time in my sermon defining words uh, so that we can understand what is uh, in there. Um, the idea that I, actually I think it is a good idea to define your terms um, before you you speak, and even more important when you're dealing with you know these people you're talking about, make them define their terms. They can define what they're talking about and then don't give them any quarter on it. Um, because you can say is then you're being very foolish and redefining a term. You don't change reality by redefining the word. This is what the word means. This is what it's always meant. So, you know, you go on. Truth uh, is not compromised. You go back to the truth. You tell them the truth and then let God take over from there. Um, we, we can't. Part of the reason that we end up in trouble is... Um, let's see if I say this in a nice way. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the last couple of weeks I've talked about uh, what Peter says about the role of women and the role of men, and I've been pretty straightforward with it. But one of the things I generally find that women want to make sure the relationship's okay. So you'll you'll accept a whole lot more than a, than a man will. But most of our men have been emasculated, and so they've been taught the same thing of kind of how you're describing it is, mm -hmm. you know, listen to my story, et cetera, et cetera. And then they want to keep changing the parameters of the discussion. It's like, you can't let them do that. It's like, this is truth, and you're going to have to deal with reality, whether you like it or not. And here's what God has said about it. And when God has said it, that's it. This is reality. He determines it, not us. We've been to him. Um, and I think that's true in every area of life. We have to make sure that we're speaking the truth, we're trying to understand the truth, our humility comes in trying to make sure we understand the truth correctly, uh, but then making sure we're also, you know, holding others to account to the same thing. Don't let people redefine words. That's, I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that point there. The other thing I'm gonna add from a theological standpoint, Satan's 
one of Satan's tragedies has always been to destroy the language by redefining terms. That's why when you look through uh, the etymology of a, of a term, you just see so many different uh, changes to this over time is because it, it just leaves language confusing. We end up, we're not talking about the same thing. We need to be talking about it, but we end up, we're not talking about the same thing because the language means something completely different. That happens so often in theology, and that's why if you're reading theological statements for like a you know church statement of faith, they get longer and longer and longer because we have to add more terms to define what we mean because other people have redefined it into something that doesn't make any sense anymore. So yeah. Now, it, what is concupiscent? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to define. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's true though. It, it, I see this all over the place that you spend more time sometimes trying to figure out how someone's defining a word, and you, there's it's uh, partially because I think of this destruction of language. C.S. Lewis talked about it too that language um, is weaponized to to carry a um, an emotion that's negative and and it's like touching an oven every time that word comes it's like that's hot i don't want to touch that and so today if you're called a racist let's say uh, to pick one example it doesn't really mean anything there's no actual definition it's just a nasty thing you can say that conveys a nasty emotion that no one wants to stick to them and so i think one of the, my main thing is this is super short because this is something I've had to learn over time and I still am struggling to learn it, but I've developed somewhat of a thicker skin and you know what? Someone calls me a racist or, or whatever other pejorative you're, you know, it's kind of like the meme, uh, Lord of the Rings meme, you know, you have no power here. Sorry. Like you, mm -hmm. you can call me that all day, but that doesn't actually mean anything. And for you to just be, uh, banding about nonsensical, um, terms, you know, it makes you the, 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 the one that should be embarrassed. And we have to return to that somehow. And the only way is people are um, going to have to do it one at a time. So, you know, if, if everyone listening here just said, you know what, next time I'm called a racist, I'm not going to like get all offended right away and like try to prove that I'm not, you know, I'm not saying don't do that and don't prove that you're not, but, um, <clears throat> but you have to figure out what they're saying first. Like, it, it makes no sense to go into like, well, here's all my friends who are Hispanic or like they have no right to just call you a name without any justification or definition, if that makes sense. So um, this is what I have a problem with a lot of political conservatives for, because they do this kind of thing. They're called homophobic and like they're like, oh, no, I have gay friends. And it's like. What, what, you should ask them, what do you mean by homophobic? Like, define, if you can't define it, I'm not even having a conversation with you. It's pointless, you know? So, anyway. Yeah, but uh, I hope that yeah. helped. Did no, you have another you. question? Um, my last question. Go for it. I did. It's super short. Um, and it's just, what historical hierarchies do you think did it well in terms of what Weaver's talking about? Man. All right. I have many thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is like a very dangerous question here. We, I, I'm afraid I'll, to answer because of what you just. I'll tell you yeah. what Weaver said. I mean, we can we, talk about it another time too. <laughs> I, I, the short answer is Weaver thought the old. I'm not South. afraid. I don't do this for a living. <laughs> yeah, Weaver thought the old South was uh, <laughs> idyllic, and and because it um, carried it, it uh, preserved this kind of medieval relationship that existed between the um the, the the landed gentry and you know those who work the land there was a relationship of mutual affection and so weaver's not he doesn't justify slavery or anything like that which is why you you, you have to be careful um in how you uh present you, you actually have to read his whole book really to figure this out the southern tradition at bay but um what he's talking about is very similar to what like Roman Catholic teaching was concerned about uh, in like the 1850s. And there were some encyclicals the Pope made uh, that where he was trying, and he even used the word social justice. It's one of its earliest uses. And it's not what we think of today as social justice. And he was just describing, well, there's a relationship that exists between people who own the land and the people who work the land, and it's a mutual affection. And so their lots are tied together. They one fails, the other one fails. They they need each other. It's a symbiotic relationship, and it's it's a good thing. And if that if the industrial revolution shatters that, what do what do we do? And so the Catholic Church was trying to tell 
the captains of industry, well, you still have a responsibility to provide for these people and, um, and provide for their well-being. You, you haven't just because it's a, a, you know, there's a paycheck and it's a different kind of arrangement doesn't mean there shouldn't be mutual affection still. And um, a lot of that's been destroyed, though. We don't even have hardly you have to go back to these uh, old literature, you know, older literature to find out what it used to be like. And there was a mutual affection. It, the, the poor didn't hate the rich. I mean, that's a novel idea. So. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to give me like, to give you a specific answer. I don't think there's any perfection, obviously, in any example I give. Someone's going to try to poke a hole in it. But we, we were thought that early America um, had something unique that's been lost. And um, I think he's probably right about that. So anyway. Um, all right. Well, uh, I'm going to move to describe somewhat and I'll take my stand. Yeah, they, they do describe it. And again, they don't defend slavery. And that's the thing that everyone thinks. They're like, oh, you're going to... No, it, it's... that that's You got to think... You got to take two intellectual steps back and you got to think through how this class of people who had been molded by these virtues and the sense of responsibility, how they thought and how they took their responsibility. Um, if you just assume presentism, it's like everyone was just a... Like 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 your boss today, man. If my, <laughs> then, then you would think that... Um, anyone in a, in a hierarchy over you is, is evil or something. And it's, they didn't have that view. Um, but you could go to England, you could go to Europe. Uh, you could, um, I mean, I'm thinking in the Western tradition, I'm sure there's other places, but in the old Testament, you had that Abraham. Oh my goodness. I mean, but, um, Hey, thank you, Hannah. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. We're going to go to, uh, Andrew. Uh, <coughs> sorry, you've been waiting patiently, Andrew. Thanks for, uh, dropping in. What's on your mind? Ah, that's okay. You can hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I was, I'm going to be here anyway, whether you bring me on to ask a question or not. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks. I, uh, I didn't read the book, but I, I joined tonight to hear you all give an introduction of the author in the book. And uh, it sounds fascinating. I'm going to have to pick it up and read it. I'm, you've, you've definitely whet my appetite for it. Um, but the question I asked, I think, is... Uh, Pretty, pretty short one or, or a simple one. I actually want to know if this is an oversimplification. Um, you know, you've been talking about um, these you know, problems with uh, like hierarchy and meaning and eschatology um, from a philosophical uh, angle that uh, Weaver took in this book and his other writings. But like a lot of Christians, it seems to me, or maybe it's just the ones that I know, they wouldn't really take part in this kind of a conversation. They would be lost five minutes in or they would be right. overwhelmed. Um, and they would just maybe, they would maybe even ask the pastor in this call, Hey, can you just simplify this and show me where, what's the theological error? Where's, what's the part of the Bible I need to shore up and know what, um, what practice, uh, do I need to make sure I'm not overlooking that, that people in Weaver's time were overlooking. And what, what I keep thinking of is like, there's this ministry you all probably heard of, um, answers in Genesis or Ken Ham's ministry. And they, constantly go over different cultural issues um, that we have been facing or continue to face in Western culture. And they just keep sim simplifying it down to into that these problems are rooted in a rejection of Genesis 1 to 11. And that that, the, re the reason that's been rejected is largely because of the acceptance of Darwinism. And it can be tied back to that. Do you, um, do you all think that's an oversimplification or the theological angle is pretty much just right. It might just be that simple that the rejection of Genesis 1 to 11 or compromise as like organizations like BioLogos have engaged in and other pseudo evangelical organizations and the, how that's affected the church. I know I, I was a part of a conservative church that they would tell you in private, the elders would, that they believed Genesis 1 to 11. They just didn't care to bring it up very much in mm -hmm. ministry. Um, because it's hard to teach, it brings up challenging questions. So I, I just wanted to know what your thoughts on that were. If, if that theological problem corresponds to the philosophical problems that Weaver brings up in this book. Okay, I'll take this one. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, it's my hobby horse too. Uh, as I was reading through Weaver's uh, book, I found he basically is simply presenting a philosophical approach to that exact same problem. Um, he doesn't define it well. I can see his own loss because he doesn't have a strong theological foundation. His is a cultural theological foundation. Uh, that's why, you know, a religiousness among uh, the Southerners that held sway for their culture. 
but still what is still underlying it is this loss that he sees and he can call it transcendental uh transcendental well, what transcendentals yeah uh <laughs> what is transcendent uh, yeah thank you the transcendentals uh he can call it that but what's really been lost is the foundation that there is a God who's created everything. There's an order to this creation. There's a hierarchy in this creation because there's a purpose for this creation. And I just find that he's actually just making the philosophical arguments for that very same thing. Uh, I find AIG is very good at taking you back to the foundations. When the foundations are lost, everything else is going to start crumbling. And that is true. And it's true in theology when pastors elders the churches will not take a stand on what the bible actually says their ministry is already crumbling they just don't even realize that if you can't stand on <clears throat> what god said in genesis you've lost all basis for the rest of your interpretation you've already made jesus uh then claiming to believe things that aren't true um and and you're you're compromising everything so aig actually does a very good job in taking you back why these foundational issues are so important uh, to uh, cultural issues, practical issues, to the uh, gospel of Christ as well. I, I don't find it's, a, uh, it's not an oversimplification. It's, it's, it, it is the foundation. If the foundations are lost, we're, you're done. Yeah, Weaver does go after Darwin, by the way, in the <clears> book, <throat> um, in two places. But he, he I'll just read the, uh, the first one, I think, mm -hmm. uh, is where he says... Um, uh, the social philosophers of the 19th century found in Darwin powerful support for their thesis that human beings act always out of economic incentives, and it was they who completed the abolishment, ab uh, uh, yeah, abolishment of freedom of the will. So he's saying that what's going on in science, um, when also took place in philosophy, and um, and so I, I think he'd be critical of Darwin. The thing. Um, I, I know what you're saying in, in that, you know, a lot of Christians would just, they just uh, would want to simplify it down to get, give me the Bible verse and what I need to do. And I think what I'm trying to say, the reason I'm doing this uh, book and, and while we'll do other books, um, some might be similar, some might be different, but I, I'm okay with this level of academic approach is because I want to call Christians to a little bit of a higher standard as far as understanding the times in which we live. They're, they're, like, there's no way I would have been able to critique or notice some of the things that I've seen, I think, if I didn't not just know scripture, but also know the world I was living in. So I'm not saying know the world as an authority, right? The, the, that's not like a, a final authority. The scripture is my final authority, but I need to know how to apply it. And if I don't know the world I live in, it's hard to know how to apply it. I have seen, and I, I'm going to be very careful here because I love answers in Genesis. I've been to the Ark. I've been to the Creation Museum a few times. Very positive. I have noticed, though, there are times when I think um, they will try to pigeonhole issues into it's a, it's a Genesis issue. And because it's so fundamental, most issues are. But um, like, for instance, the issue of critical race theory, to, to pick one example, you know, that's, that's an issue that does Genesis address this? It does. But it's not maybe in the simplistic way that I've heard at least people influenced by um, uh, some of the creation science have framed it. Because, and the reason is because they don't understand it most of the time. They don't understand what critical race theory actually is. Cri they, they misunderstand it and they think what critical race theory is, is thinking some races are better than others. And you can uh, you have racial prejudice on the basis of that. And they will go back to biological evolution being wrong, and then they'll knock it down with an argument that we're all made in the image of God. The problem is critical race theory, though, is postulating the idea that there are uh, that race itself is a social construct. It doesn't really actually exist in the in the real world. So what AIG ends up critiquing something. They, um, I, I've seen this at least. I'm not saying all their articles are like this, but I think they they want to take an issue that if they had a little bit sometimes more of a philosophical understanding of what that issue is, they could maybe do a better critique. And I'm, I'm already regretting the way I'm phrasing this because I really, <laughs> I'm not trying to get down on AIG because I love AIG and I think everyone should support them. Um, I hope what I'm saying is making sense. And maybe one of you can save me so that uh, I'll save you. Yeah. <laughs> I think all you're really saying is that uh, I think it goes with Andrew's question. Is it an oversimplification? And sometimes you just wish they would add a little bit more, so that they're hitting the foundation, but that needs to be expressed a little bit more, uh, in this case, critical race theory and the philosophical aspects of what the issue really is.
how's that? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah, <clears throat> they, they need to look at um, the, the idea that God actually did separate people at Babel and did want um, people in certain places to have unique characteristics. That was part of his or, or ordained will, at least. That would answer critical race theory, that, that particular section of scripture, more than, well, he created us all in his image, if that makes sense, because you're actually mm -hmm. applying, right? So the Bible's sufficient, but not everything's in Genesis 1 through 11, because God gave us an entire Bible, with, and it's all, right, um, profitable. So, yeah. Um, David, right. you have anything on that? I mean, just, um, just, I mean, you just mentioned Babel. That's what I was thinking of. I, I think that's kind of the beauty of Christianity is that you can talk at an intellectual level that's a lot higher. You can dig really, really deep. You can get into all sorts of nuances and, you know, argumentations. But, um, you know, somebody with, I don't know, somebody with Down syndrome, somebody who is, is mentally challenged could understand the concept of, you know, um, a bunch of people came together and said, we're going to make a tower that's going to reach towards heaven and nothing will be impossible to us. And God said, no, you're not. I'm going to confuse your languages. And it was, you know, and they were dispersed across the earth. And yet there seems to be a, I don't know what I would probably call a satanic plot to bring Babel back. And, you know, you could fit most of the central planning and the globalism and all this stuff into that box. And it's as simple as that. So we can get into all these nuanced discussions and everything, but at the same time, yeah, it's that simple. It's Babel. Yeah. Yeah. Weaver's fighting that. So, yeah. Does that help, Andrew? <laughs> you got a lot yeah, more than you bargained for. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate Cheers. you coming on. Thank you. And uh, and the book is unaudible, by the way, if you like that kind of thing. I should mention that to everyone. That's how I listened to it first, because I didn't have time to sit there and read it. Um, anyway. All right. Well, we're going to bring uh, Mary Beth uh, back in. Can you hear us, Mary Beth? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm glad I, it worked out. Yeah, me too. I was I'm not very technological. I'm not good at As it. As you can see, neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was just I don't have a question or anything. This has been great. And I was just listening last night to um I don't know if you know of George Grant. I heard that um, name. Parish mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church. He's yeah. in Tennessee, and um, he's doing this three-week, once a week, um, Christ and culture. And last night he went into just um, the history of how we got to where we are. I mean, even a little before Darwin and that, but he, it's it was really great. Um, and then next week he's going into, you know, how we make a difference where we are today as the body of Christ. Yeah, George Grant, he's got to be, what, 60s, 70s? <clears throat> yeah, he is 67. <laughs> okay, yeah, I thought he was about my age because uh, yeah, a prolific yep. writer, especially in the 80s, yes. 90s. <laughs> yes, well, even now, I mean, he does continue to write some. Um, but yeah, he does a lot of teaching. His history is great. Um, he has, um, a series on four aspects of the history. I mean, four, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Oh, I you're did fine. not expect to talk. So, um, yeah. So you just want he to plug his four cycles. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be great to find out what George Grant thinks of, uh, Richard Weaver. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, if I had a better memory, I wouldn't tell you. It. He's probably <laughs> somebody that he would recommend reading. Yeah. And last night he was recommending, like, um, Amusing Ourselves to Death, oh. uh, that book. <laughs> and I don't know, writers. <laughs> and, you know, really good reading. Yeah. So... Well, but cool. anyways, if you go to his website, the Parish Press Church website, people can view that, watch what he did last night. So that's all. Cool. That's well, thank you. I appreciate that, Mary Beth. Thanks yeah. for stopping by and letting us know. So yep. yeah, if that's something that interests you, anyone uh, listening, go check it out. Yeah. Okay. So, is there anything else or, or is that... Uh, 
No, it's just been great. And I, oh, I good. hope you do more, more books. Yeah, and... I'll figure out the technology better too. So we're, it's a work in progress, but, um, yeah, I wanted to do just some more positive things. So I appreciate you uh, uh, coming in the chat and maybe we'll talk some more next time. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you. All right. I know. God bless. God Did bless Barbara you. Get back in the queue. Uh, yeah. Um, Barb, I, I don't think so. Yeah, That's, the first one. Did she get back in the queue? I don't. Yeah, I don't see her. Yeah. Um, uh, James Starbuck writes in the live chat, I'm here to pick on Doug Wilson, ask you to define concupiscence and slam answers in Genesis. So. <laughs> Not slam. This is the problem. Great. Bringing up I know. And I, I, I was, the warning signs were going off in my head and I didn't, and I probably blew it, but I was, this I'm is just another, being honest. See, this, is a, this is another issue is the issue of, um, uh, is the know. issue of, of front loading all of your disclaimers. I have to like disclaim, disclaim, but then there's only one thing that is heard. Like that was negative. It's like, okay. I know. <laughs> yep. That's what's going to happen. So answers in Genesis. I love you and, uh, would love to have you actually, I probably should ask Ken Ham if he wants to come. He's probably too much of a star to come on this podcast. Maybe not. We'll, well see. You never know. He, he I is, should ask uh, him. You, I, I think what you're doing matches much what fits in well with what he's trying to do well yeah, yeah same and, objective we want to go back to a biblical standard and um yeah we yeah i mean he's just in a different arena and that's and that yeah. which is fine he's fighting a different battle and um it's a battle that needs to be fought there's no doubt but um you know one thing i forget I, go ahead sorry i just said we're glad we're on the same team <laughs> yeah we're on the same team one of the things I forgot to say uh, <laughs> at the beginning, and I, <laughs> I wanted to start the whole thing with this, is that Richard Weaver is the anti Tim Keller, um, because we're naming names. well, Tim Keller, well, yeah, Tim Keller, I've named that name I don't know how many times. I'm not going to get in trouble for that. Uh, Tim Keller, get in trouble if you don't. <laughs> yeah, probably. Tim Keller, though, his whole scheme, I've talked about it many times before, is that the cities are the place where God's he almost acts like it's he's most at work there and we should be most invested there and like cities are important to be invested in but he acts like it's god's purpose though it's 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 kind of a weird view he's got um that be, and, and he, he says because look god ends the whole the new jerusalem's a city he ends everything with the city and that's part of factors into why we should value cities so much and um richard weaver basically is is sort of the anti-urban guy like a lot of what he says, ideas have consequences is basically a critique of urban living. And it wasn't cities per se. It was these crazy um, megapolis things that we have now. Like you go back to the 1700s, they didn't have cities on the scale we have now. And it, you include the suburbs yeah. and everything else. So um, he thought it was an artificial environment. We're, we're actually not to that chapter yet, but he talks about it in the, the one he the, about spoiled brats <laughs> that... The, that artificial living um, gives you the impression that man can pr science and man can provide everything for you and um, you forget God. And, and anyway, um, we need to be in the cities for sure. But that's one of the things that I think struck me about Weaver, especially reading so much Keller. Is which that, cities? Which cities do we need he to be in? Chicago. I, Jeddah, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> no, just New York Wait, City, Chicago, yeah. Los Angeles, just Americans. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It, he could what is this in Chicago, but it's OK to be like, you know, at a small church somewhere in the country. Like that's a that's also a mission field. And I don't know, his, his whole outreach is city to city, which, uh, you know, we need the cities, but we need we need everywhere. People. It's people. It's not cities. So anyway, thought I just mentioned that about Weaver. If you really don't like Tim Keller, read Richard Weaver and you'll uh, you'll, you'll not like him more. So um, any final thoughts before we end the live stream? Um, well, I appreciate being invited in there, uh, into this. <laughs> My first reading through Weaver was like, what is he talking about? Uh, and then I am amazed that he wrote this in 1948. It seems like he must have been writing it last week or something. Um, I do recommend reading it. I, I think it'd be a good read for people to be challenged. Uh, just take in mind that he is writing from a philosophical standpoint. Um, <clears throat> that parallels a theological one, um, but he's not writing as as a Christian, or at least not a not a born again Christian. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's writing as a, 
I, my, the sense I get is uh, he, he uses a lot of biblical Southern illustrations. Southern cultural Christian. Yeah, he's a cultural Christian. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, a couple of just a couple <clears throat> of little things. Um, one would be just in thinking about specialization. So that's a um, you know that's a topic that is really just not touched a lot in um, in the conservative sphere, I guess blogosphere. Um, but I remember the first time I ever kind of realized that that might be an issue that was kind of wrong was I was in college and I took a Shakespeare class and my professor, um, he, he was a professor of Shakespeare, but he had a very specific expertise. He was the authority on the history of the putting on of the play, the historical putting on of the play Twelfth Night. So he would, he would be called to different universities. He would do different fellowships. And that was his thing. That's what he was known for internationally was if you wanted to know not about the play, but about how the play had been performed historically, that particular play, um, then he was the guy. And I remember just having this huge impression of, oh my goodness, that is sad. Like this guy's in his seventies and his life has amounted to this, you know? And you know, he enjoys Shakespeare, great. I mean, I love Shakespeare. I didn't before I took the class. He helped me a little bit kind of discover a love for Shakespeare. But I mean, how sad is that, you know, to, to get to the end of your life and that's all you got is just, hey, I can tell you how this play got performed, you know? So, um, yeah. uh, so that's just one thing that I guess to think about maybe critically. And then just the challenge of the book is it's good to, you know, it's a beneficial thing to challenge yourself intellectually. Um, you know, it's like phones are extraordinarily addictive and um you know it's very very easy to get in the habit of just kind of being a scroller because everybody's doing it and um you know one way to try to fight that is to put your phone away sit down with a book like this and you know challenge yourself a little bit intellectually to um you know to you know try to be more of a whole person you know like the the thing he puts is if you're if you're hyper specialized um, or if you're just kind of going with the tide of culture then you're not a whole person you you are a, right. um, <clears throat> You're, you're kind of a divided person so you know it's just something to to take into consideration and um you know challenge yourself well maybe to piggyback on that one is read histories as well uh obviously weaver's understanding is because he he must have some good understanding of history or he wouldn't be able to see those trends yeah no very true well we're gonna end it um yeah thank you everyone for participating you've kind of been welcomed into uh, my living room and discussions that might have happened around my table uh, growing up. And um, we're going to take suggestions on how this could be made better in the future. So some of you might want it longer, believe it or not. Some of you are like that. Some of you, probably more of you might want it shorter, or you might have suggestions on um, a different format. And, and I already, I'm aware of the technological things. I'm, I'll correct those for next time. But uh, let me know if you have any other uh, critiques or um, suggestions, because I'll take them into account. I want to do more of this. So Anyway, God bless everyone and bye now.